Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier, and thank you for stopping by. Uh, let me start with some macro thoughts, because there's so much going on. Uh, Eric Hanseder, chart of yesterday's two holes in the XIV, a velocity-based ETF. Oh, the irony, blue upper band, red lower. Second is from Holger, China Yuan weakens after PBOC cuts interest rates, reserve levels, the US dollar, Chinese yuan fix a new year to date high. Three, Holger, Shanghai Composite closes 1.3% down at 2927.29 after volatile session as PBOC's double cut fails to convince investors. And finally, with my macro thoughts, again, Holger. The chart that tells the whole story, China fails to calm nerves, fear index VIX off the highs but at elevated levels. Let's go to home thoughts and uh, Tagore came to mind today. The smile that flickers on a baby's lips when he sleeps, does anyone know where it was born? There is a rumour that a young pale beam of a crescent moon touched the edge of a vanishing autumn cloud, and there the smile was first born in the dream of a dew-washed morning. Let me put up a photograph of Hannah uh, with two of uh, the golden retriever puppies. Uh, there are four left, uh, and we are really reluctant to uh, hand any of them over anymore so courteous, charming, and genteel. Tagore again, the butterfly counts not months, but moments, and has time enough. Let your life lightly dance on the edges of time, like dew on the tip of a leaf. Political reflections, the FT, questions over Li Keqiang's future amid China market turmoil. The China-led turmoil that has rocked global markets in the past two weeks has also shaken the ruling Communist Party and left Li Keqiang, the Prime Minister, fighting for his political future, according to analysts and people familiar with the internal workings of the party. Among party officials and politically connected people in Beijing, the hottest topic of conversation is whether Mr. Li will take the fall for, mis for Beijing's perceived mismanagement of the stock market crash and the country's broader economic slowdown. Premier Li's position has certainly become more precarious as a result of the current crisis, said Willy Yam, an expert on Chinese politics at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. If the situation worsens and if there comes a point where President Xi Jinping really needs a scapegoat, then Li fits the bill. Um, this Monday, as the benchmark index fell 8.5% in its worst performance since early 2007, Mr. Li's only public statement was a call for the development of China's 3D printing industry. I concluded by saying everyone is dispensable, and then refer you to this article I wrote on the 6th of July, when I said the bull market is now being mauled by bears. I said, consider that there are more individual investors in the stock market than there are Communist Party members, and you will appreciate that this stock market crash represents probably the biggest political risk to the neo-totalitarian Xi Jinping. According to a report in The Independent, Saudi Arabia executes a person every two days as the rate of beheading soars under King Salman. Kingdom killed 102 convicted criminals in the first six months of 2015 alone, and putting it on course to beat its 1995 record number for the calendar year of 192. In some cases, the remains of those executed were displayed in public as a deterrent to others, Amnesty said, typically done in cases of haraba or banditry. This involved tying the decapitated corpse along with the victim's head in a bag to a post in a public square. Um, and then I came across this tweet, June 25, latest execution in ISIS Caliphate? No, Saudi Arabia beheading a woman from Myanmar. Let me put up a photograph of King Salman and also say that my view is that the kingdom is overreaching and is thrashing around like Gulliver thrashed around. The oil move was a monumental blunder. A 
According to officials, the South Sudanese president may sign peace deal today. South Akir may sign a peace deal with the rebels on Wednesday, more than a week after refusing to do so. UN Security Council threatened to act immediately if he doesn't. And interestingly, oil-rich South Sudan's public debt has climbed from zero at its independence in 2011 to $4.2 billion as of June. Let's see if this is worth the paper it's written on. I'll put up a photograph of the VIP room at Juba Airport taken 2,094 days ago by me. International markets, Holger again, today's 660-point trading range for the Dow looks tame in comparison to yesterday's 1,100 points, which of course was the biggest single, uh, was the biggest uh, ever intraday move on the Dow Jones that we've ever seen yesterday. Uh, currency markets, Euro is at 114.58, dollar index 94.22, Japanese Yen is at 119.34. I still think the yen could rally sharply, um, but obviously it's in the no man's land now. You've got to catch them, catch the wave. Uh, Swissy 0.9450, the pound uh, 156.49. Um, the Aussie, which has been having a really tough time of late, 0.7139. India rupee 66.295. South Korean won 1183.36. <coughs> the real 360.42 here without my objective of 4. Egyptian pound 783.72 and the South African rand 1309.48. But admittedly, I checked that a long time ago. Dollar yen, let me put up a three month chart. Uh, there's been extraordinary volatility in the last few sessions, and it's a proxy for global risk, as it were. Euro dollar 114.53. There was massive short covering, it became a sort of safe haven. Um, and squeezed higher as the one is marked lower. That will continue to affect it, actually. Dollar Canada, let me put up a six-month chart. I think it's going, going, gone to 140. Commodity markets take you back. Um, I did say that I thought the commodity super cycle was dead in the water. I said that in November last year. Gold, we're now at 11.34. And it's interesting, it got through 11.50, traded bit higher, but it seems to have been rejected that by that level, which is what I thought would happen. 10th of August, writing about crude oil, I said the meltdown is coming, and uh, let me put up a one-year crude oil chart. My target is now $32.50. China's central bank cut its benchmark lending rate for the fifth time since November and lured the amount of cash banks must set aside. Um, so let's see how that uh, is responded to, but I, I don't see a big response. I think monetary policy is losing its usefulness to achieve what it's seeking to achieve. And uh, over the weekend I wrote that piece, China Royals the Markets, and I was being a bit tongue-in-cheek quoting someone quoting an IMF official who said it's totally premature to speak of a crisis in China. And then, uh, for those who are the conspiracy theorists amongst us, have a look at what Michel Chosidovsky is saying when he's talking about economic destabilization, financial meltdown, and the rigging of the Shanghai stock market. His theory is that Obama's pivot to Asia directed against China is reinforced through concurrent destabilizing actions on the Shanghai Stock Exchange. The ultimate intent is to undermine, through non-military means, the national economy of the People's Republic of China. And yesterday I did say, POTUS is an oil and currency warfare specialist, and the Chinese have been as blindsided as was Vladimir Putin. The real, when I looked last, was at 360. Let me put up a one-year chart and remind you of my target from a while back, which was four. And I think we're headed there rather inexorably now. I like this tweet from Arati Kumar Rao, the Sunder Bands in Bangladesh. Fishermen. Let's move to sub Saharan Africa. If China sneezes, Africa can now catch a cold, researchers with the International Monetary Fund concluded last year. Already, South Africa's rand has hit its lowest in 19 months and stocks declined 4%. In Zambia, major copper producer for China, the kwacha has fallen to an all time low of 8.575 versus the dollar. If the meltdown is a sign that China's long expected economic slowdown is finally upon us, 
Here is who will be hit the hardest. Given the fact that exports to China have accounted for 30% of the region's total export growth between 2005 and 2012, it's not hard to see why exports would suffer. A 1% decline in domestic investment growth would likely be accompanied with a 0.6 percentage point decline in the region's export growth, researchers from the IMF concluded in a 2013 paper. For commodity exporters, Angola, South Africa, the Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the region's top five exporters to China, <coughs> a 1% decline will mean a 0.8% percentage point decrease. Uh, without Chinese investment and trade, African economies will have to make up for a shortfall in capital from abroad to complete these projects. We find that Africa is highly vulnerable to China's slowdown, Oliver White, an economist with the London-based research firm Fathom Consulting. And I agree with him. But it's actually, in, in, a, in an interesting way, Kenya is a little bit of a shield. In a, in a, it's, a, it's a safe haven because we don't have that many exports going to China. They're not buying our tea because it's black and not green. We don't, apparently, not exporting oil. So it keeps us in an interesting place. New Burundian government retains key ministers. Burundian President Pierre and Kurenzinza Monday announced a new government following his re election in a controversial third term. Observers note several key ministers from the ruling CNDD FDD party have been retained. They include Foreign Minister Alan Nyamitwe, who's actually very outspoken on Twitter, who told VOA recently Kurenzinza is ready to form a more inclusive unity government. Innocent Mohosi, uh, general manager of the banned independent Renaissance radio and television network of Burundi, said the return of Alain Guillaume Bunyoni. As Public Security Minister suggests, Kurenzinza wants to continue the crackdown on his critics. This new government, for me, is not a surprise because it includes the main figures of the former government, including the Foreign Affairs Minister, the Defence Minister and Finance Minister. Then there's also the comeback of the former Security Minister, who in the Hutu days was seen as the, one of the main figures of the ruling party in the government. So it seems that it is a government of non-inclusion, but may be willing to fight against those they will have to confront, he said. Um, uh, Muhozi said there is nothing inclusive about the new government. Instead, he said the new government has become more oppressive. Padresh, you know, by now you know he's sitting in Burundi somewhere, just tell me what to confess to, he tweets, Amnesty Report on the use of torture. South Africa's economic woes worsen as GDP contracts 1.3% contracted in the second quarter. Group GDP fell for the first time in more than a year, declining and annualized 1.3% from the previous quarter when it expanded 1.3%. The median estimate of 18 economists was for GDP to gain 0.6%. There are unfortunately very few factors telling us that economic growth and activity can pick up, especially in the context of the weak international economy, and particularly China, one can't rule out the possibility of a recession in South Africa. Manufacturing makes up about 13% of the economy, contracted and annualized 6.3% in the second quarter. Mining dropped 6.8%. Agriculture declined 17.4%. Half of the 10 GDP sub-industries fell. Financial services, construction and transport expanded. There are strikes, the super cycle of minerals has died. Leola said those who have set these targets have to sit up straight and say, what are we going to do to get to these targets? Again, I think they're a bit dysfunctional down there, frankly. My government values re-engagement of the Western world and the Zimbabwe economy, President Robert Mugabe. Giving his State of the Nation address in the capital Harare, Mugabe called for strengthening of ties with multilateral institutions, which include the IMF and the World Bank. My government values the engagement of the Western world and the Zimbabwe economy. They owe lenders about $8.4 billion. The economy will probably expand 1.5% this year, um, and jobs are being lost at an enormous pace. Zimbabwe's President Robert Mugabe was booed in Parliament over economic crisis. This is in The Guardian. Um, spoke as the UN confirmed early estimates that around 1.5 million Zimbabweans, or 16% of the country's population, will face hunger later this year and need food aid. 
when Mugabe, who has been in power since Zimbabwe's independence in 1980, outlined his government's plan to improve the economy, one lawmaker yelled at him to admit you can't do much about it. Others shouted, if wishes were horses, you have utterly failed. The government cut its growth forecast to 1.5% from 3.2%. Look, I think there's been a change in language. We're trying to re-engage, but it took him a very long time to work it out, and he can't go it alone. It's sort of Saddam-esque, isn't it? You take your whole country, you fight a fight you can't win, and you waste everyone's time and lives. Amidst the heckling, Mugabe continued unfazed and read his speech through to the end. DRC trimmed its 2015 economic growth forecast to 8.4%. They're going to, have to trim it some more on Monday from an earlier prediction of 9.2% as copper prices hit six year lows. South African oil share rebounded 2.83% yesterday, but remains down 1.58% year to date. Dollar Rand, let me put up a one month chart. Look at that spike we saw on Monday. Uh, Egyptian EGX30 uh, down 2.75 percent, actually up 2.75 percent, uh, but down 23.41 percent year to date. President Buhari, um, I like this photograph, uh, tweeted on June 22nd, resumed duty this morning. And we had this wonderful photograph of him at his desk. Then coming in the back of my mind was this play that I studied at school for Waiting for Godot. And I thought, are we waiting for Godot or is it President Buhari to appoint a cabinet, amongst other things? Nigerian second quarter economic growth slows on oil plunge. Um, GDP expanded 2.35% on an annual basis compared with 3.96% a quarter earlier. Oil industry contracted 6.8%. This is not a good result for Nigeria. Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari, who took office in May in the country's first democratic transfer of power, has yet to name a cabinet and hasn't articulated his economic vision for the nation. The Nairobi, or, oh, sorry, the Nigerian oil share is at six month lows and down 16.879%. I'll put up a Bloomberg chart that Chris K uh, tweeted earlier, and you can see. The Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index is down 4.82% year to date. Coming to Kenya, Uchumi has appointed Mr. Julius Kipnich Titch as the Chief Executive Officer. The official release is on the website on the front page and under rich wrap-ups if you care to have a look. Uchumi has of course had a torrid time and its current market cap capitalization is just 2.718 billion shillings. Transcentury reported first half earnings per share they had a loss of 2 shillings and 16 cents. Um, let's have a look at that. Revenue was up 5.1%. Uh, loss, uh, EPS lost 2 shillings and 16 cents. They had a loss, EPS loss of 5 shillings and 92 cents uh, the previous reporting period. So there's an improvement. Group revenues, they said, grew by 5% despite being impacted by a 25% decline in our power division's revenues. Significant interruptions of production processes in our copper factory due to ongoing final phase of capacity and efficiency upgrades. Growth in revenue attributable to ongoing execution of major construction projects in the engineering division. The outlook is positive. I think the recovery is still a ways off. And you know, you will recall they liquidated in the last full year reporting period their stake in RBR. And on that note, let me put up a photograph of the Mombasa Nairobi Railway just outside the entrance to Sabo East, and another one of the railway crossing at Manyani Gate, Sabo. Again, East African Cables reported first half earnings per share, uh, they reported a loss of 11 cents versus a profit of 82 cents the last time round. Profit after they made a loss after tax of 70.934 million versus a profit of 231.822 million last time. Overall decline in performance attributable to significant interruptions in our production processes, Transcentury over stake in East African Cable, so they were talking about the same thing. Um, as we conclude the last phase of our capacity upgrade, despite the interruptions, Kenya remained profitable, but Group recorded a loss owing to our Tanzania operation, which was heavily impacted by FX losses. Um, and they also issued a full year profits warning. So if you want to have a look at that, that's on rich wrap ups as well. Can you show they quite well behaved? 10380 area, uh, last time I had a look. Um, 
little changed, uh, touched 104, and Central Bank came in and intervened a little bit. Nairobi all shares down 12.33% year to date at 17 month lows and fell 2.46% yesterday. It's probably fallen again today. Uh, NSE 20 is down 17.015%, another 32 month closing low. Um, Equity turnover has been actually very light. Uh, if you look at the two-day slump Monday, Tuesday, and even today when I looked last, at, uh, and that might be a silver lining of a kind, has been hammered, however, and has imported international volatility, I think, closer to home. You just have to look around sub-Saharan African space. Egypt's got hammered. South Africa's back to below scratch for the year, uh, and Lagos as well. So I think, you know, that combination has put pressure on our markets. Um, and uh, But, you know... Gives you good opportunities if you are if you have cash in the bank to pick up cheap stock because people tend to sell it carelessly when you get these sorts of environments. Once again, thank you for stopping by.